Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Thank you for joining us. We've been studying together in the book of Galatians, uh, verse by verse, and in our last study together, I think that we were, uh, in our last studies together, we've been in the area of verse 10 of chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. For the moment, they are difficult verses to leave because in some respects, involved in these few verses is the very heart of the good news, the very kernel of the good news concerning Jesus Christ. So I find it a little difficult to move too fast uh, going forward. In the early 1500s, there was a Romanist. He was uh, greatly concerned about living his life for the Lord, a, a very upright, uh, good and godly man. And he would go to confession 8, 10, 12 times a day, kind of like what people do in private today. And finally, uh, the priest that he was confessing to told him to go out and, and commit some real sins so that he'd have a reason to come to confession and Martin Luther began to seriously study the Scriptures after the priest told him that the Roman church ran on money, you know, like selling indulgences. You know, you could buy an indulgence for many things if you paid the right price. You could even buy an indulgence for killing your mother-in-law, and then you wouldn't uh, have to spend any time in purgatory, they raised uh, an immense amount of money. And Martin Luther, he studied that and he was absolutely shocked because the Word of God just didn't seem to square with, with such an activity as that. And so in 1517, he nailed the now famous... Uh, th not, thesis to the door of Wittenberg Cathedral, which uh, in many historians' minds was the beginning of the Reformation period. And the subject of that thesis was what we are now studying in Galatians verse by verse, which is justification by faith. Now that, of course, has been it, if I can use that expression, the battle cry of Protestantism since that day, but, but little understood in today's religious community. There are two ways that you could say that. One of those is justification by faith, and the other is justification on account of faith, the second uh, way is the way that the modern Christian church interprets it, but not the way Luther interpreted it. You can read, for example, uh, critical accounts of the difference between Calvinism and Lutheranism. And basically, that difference is justification by faith versus justification on account of faith. Justification by faith, folks, uh, represents God as He really is and man as man really is. Justification on account of faith represents man greater than He is and God less than He is and is terrible blasphemy, and yet it's the theme of virtually all modern Christianity. I've received letters, plural, letters, plural, very critical letters for some of the things that I've said over the years concerning the finished work of Christ. The criticisms are always the same. They just come in different forms. 
Oh, Steve, the, the historic Christian church has always taught the freedom of the will and the sovereignty of God side by side as irreconcilable this side of eternity. Now, that's not true. That may be a, a nice sentence, but it's not true. The argument is always the same. It's just couched in different terms. It was the response that I got from several prominent leaders in the church back in the 80s when I went through my early uh, days as a Christian and, and through Bible college. Went through my early uh, phase. The, the uh, you know, the world has to know correspondence phase. I grew out of that. I never knew quite how to respond. I mean, what do you do? Do you write back and say, well, you know, look, you're terribly stupid. You obviously haven't studied the subject. I, I don't know what to say. The simple truth is the Christian church has not always taught that. You know, and to read a multi-page dissertation on the difference between Calvinism and Lutheranism is, is almost pathetic. For that reason, I decided to begin today by quoting from Luther. This is the exactly the writing of Luther. All right. And I quote, It is then fundamentally necessary and wholesome for Christians to know that God foreknows nothing contingently dependent on your will. God knows nothing contingently, but that He foresees purposes and does all things according to to his own immutable, eternal, and infallible will. Now, this bombshell, it knocks free will flat. Now, I'm reading, this is not me, and, 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 uh, it, and utterly shatters it so that those who want to assert it must either deny the bombshell or pretend not to notice it or find some other, some other way of, of dodging it. I'm still reading Luther here. It is a settled truth, then, that we do everything of necessity and nothing by free will. For the power of free will is nil, and it does no good, nor can do, without grace, unless you intend efficacy to be taken in a new sense, as implying completion in our suggesting that free will can actually will and begin a thing that it is totally unable to complete. This I do not believe. I shall say more on that point later. It follows, therefore, that free will is obviously a term ap applicable only to the divine majesty, for only he can do and does, as the psalmist sings, whatever he wills in heaven and earth. Psalm 135.6 if free will is ascribed to men, it is ascribed with no more propriety than divinity itself would be, and no blasphemy could exceed that. So it befits theologians to refrain from using this term when they want to speak of human ability and to leave it to be applied to God only they would do well also to take the term out of men's mouths and speech. Let them teach that it must be denoted by some other term other than free will, especially since we know from our own observation that the mass of men are sadly deceived and misled by this phrase. Since, therefore, we have lost the meaning in the real reference of this 
glorious term, the free will of God alone, or rather have never grasped it, as was claimed by the Pelagians who themselves mistook the phrase, why do we cling so tenaciously to an empty word and endanger and delude faithful people? In consequence, there is no more wisdom in so doing than there is in the modernization enjoyable of kings and monarchs who retain or lay claim to empty titles of kingdoms and countries and flaunt them while all the time they are really paupers and anything but the possessors of those kingdoms and countries. We can tolerate their antics for they fool nobody but just feed themselves up unprofitably enough on their own vain glory. But this false idea of free will is a real threat to salvation and a delusion fraught with the most perilous consequences. End quote. To say that Lutheranism is, is opposed to Calvinism because it preaches the free will of man is foolish. I agree. It's what modern Lutherans preach, but they ought to change their name. Historically, the church has never taught, ever, the free will of man. But it is such a generally accepted idea in modern Christianity that to deny it is to open yourself up to great criticism. Our text says that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. That is absolutely evident because the Scripture says that the righteous man shall live by his faith, my faith. That's what it says in Habakkuk. The Holy Spirit quotes himself here. The just shall live out of faith or from faith. And what Luther saw was Romans 5.1, therefore having been justified by faith, and he realized that the connection is to the verses that preceded that, that Christ was delivered because of our offenses and He was raised again because He justified us. That is, He made us righteous. He then goes to Hebrews chapter 9 that Christ has already obtained eternal redemption for us. Eternal redemption. How long is that eternal redemption? Ah, uh, but Steve, you don't you you just don't know how I live. You know, I'll be lucky, I'll be lucky just to get to heaven. I'm not even sure I'm gonna make it, you know, the way I live. But now wait a minute. It's eternal redemption. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now there's so much that could be said about that. The word redeemed, as I pointed out, is ex, ex agarazzo. I've suggested in previous studies that probably the most precious term on the lips of Christians is the word redeemer. I will sing of my redeemer. Him after him has been written using that word. It is a precious word, a most precious word. Probably it wouldn't sound as good in the hymn and it wouldn't sound as good in the poems and it wouldn't sound as good in our language. Uh, but in actual fact, I think that we would be closer to the truth if we actually translated the word our ransomer. 
I will sing of my ransomer. I mean, there's nothing at all wrong with the term redeemer. But the trouble is, in modern way of the modern way of thinking, it's it's lost the sense of, of of the paying of a price. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And now your question, as Luther faced it, was 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 the price that he paid, was it sufficient? And why is the word ek or ex agarazzo, why is it ex agarazzo rather than agarazzo? All of these words could be translated better, ransom, ransom, uh, by the paying of a price. The paying of a price. You probably heard of, of the word of uh, agoraphobia, the fear of crowds, or, or you know, the fear of the marketplace. The agora was the marketplace in Greek, and and agorazo means to buy in the marketplace. And as I, I pointed out in and I believe last week in our study here that there are several reasons that you could buy. You know, that's 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 a piece of junk. You know, they call it uh, they call it an antique. You know, and if I bought that, I might sucker somebody into paying three times as much as what I paid for it. So you know, you'd buy it in order to resell it. That's that's agorazo. That's the word agorazo. Or or you could buy it in order to keep it as a prized possession. All right? There's nothing on earth that would compel you to sell it. You want it as a prize. You want it as a prized possession. You want to treasure it. And you want to keep it. And folks, that's the word. Ek agarazzo. Christ paid a price to take us as a prize, a prized possession, a valuable people, something that He paid everything that He had for, and He's not going to treat it loosely. He's not going to resell it. He's not going to let it go back into the marketplace. And then there's a word, latruo, that's the third word translated redeem. What it means, and primarily it's applied to slaves, is to pay a sufficient price to set them free. And so we've been taken out of marketability, never to be bought and sold again, never to be condemned and redeemed again. If you're looking for eternal security, there's where it is. Astounding that modern Christianity in the main the majority of Christians have people being sold and bought and sold and bought and sold and bought. That, that is redeemed, or maybe I should put it differently. You know, saved and lost, saved and lost, saved and lost, saved and lost, saved and lost. Many of, of them have a contingent as Luther put it, a synergistic redemption. God did some and you, you, you do some. I would have preferred that Luther had used the word uh, synergistic rather than contingent, but you know, I mean, he, he did live in the 15th century. You know, because I can pronounce it better. And I understand the idea of cooperation you know, the argument of Pelagius and Arminius was that what God did, it was great, but it, he, he, what He did, He did contingently. That is, contingent upon something that you do. What God didn't... What God did doesn't apply to you unless you do something. And Luther's argument, of course, was was his classic book, The Bondage of the Will, which is written against that whole Pelagian idea. If you are still a fan, a big fan of free will, I'm going to suggest that you haven't thought this through. The stupidest thing that you could do is get my little book, you know, that I wrote on free will, I don't know, 
few years back, and it's in my bedroom closet. A better thing, if you're interested in an, in an intelligent, educated approach to the subject, is to read Jonathan Edwards on the notion of the free will of man. Or, or if you just if you just like to read bombastic reading, you know, read Luther's Bondage of the Will, but, but all of the early Protestants, all of them realized that free will was a term of blasphemy. And yet it's the modern term used in Christianity today. Did Jesus Christ... Did Jesus Christ redeem us from the curse of the law because, well, we asked Him to? No. Did He, in fact, pay some kind of a price that we can you know, go up and w withdraw from the ATM enough to pay our debt? No, no, no. No. He already has purchased eternal redemption for us. Listen to Luther's words. It is apparent then that man does everything he does by necessity, by the fact that the sovereign God's working in you, both the will and to do of His good pleasure. Isn't it wonderful, folks, that verse 13 doesn't say Christ has redeemed everyone from the curse of the law? I'm sure we'd like for it to say that. If it did, well, now we would have a real problem trying to make this verse correlate with other verses of Scripture, which is extremely important. It is manifestly apparent in the Word of God that not every person is redeemed. And it's a thrill to see how carefully that the Holy Spirit uses language. The Lord hath laid on Him, Christ, the iniquity of us all. Us all. Not one single one of, of the us will be left out. Not one single one of God's children will ever be in hell or in the uh, abortion called purgatory. The price Christ paid was an absolute sufficient price for us all. Not for everyone, but for us the Lord knows whom He had chosen. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. The Lord knoweth them that are His. He bought us as a prize. Never to sell us again. And folks, I think that's wonderful. In Hebrews 9, having obtained eternal redemption for us, you know, we demolish the language we make when, when we even suggest that eternal redemption means temporary redemption. You know, that Christ paying a price was not, what He paid was, was not sufficient. It only covered past sins. And if you, well, you know, if you sin, I don't know, again, then He, like the Lamb of the Old Testament, ha must be re-slain Folks, in that he died, he died unto sin once and only once. And in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. The truth that wrenches the hearts of ministers and Christians that I talk to is that to preach what they see in the Word of God would lead all of you sheep out there to just go and sin in any way that you want to and I look at them and I try to say, well, all of the Christians I talk to are already sinning more than they want to. I don't see how I could give them the license to sin more. Grace certainly doesn't do that. Is anyone, any one of you here, any one of you willing, anyone willing to to, to Stand up and say, I, I, Steve, I don't get sin all I want to. you got to be kidding. If you can say that, I'm sorry, but 
If you can say that, I doubt that you have any revelation or any relationship with the Lord. Why would I want, want to sin against the one who loved me and gave himself for me? Of course I sin, but why would I want to do that? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. There's no personal faith in there. The modern idea is that we're justified on account of, of our personal faith, our belief. That's not true. That is not what Luther taught. As he crawled up those steps with bloody knees, he suddenly realized that he was justified by his own faithfulness. That's God's faithfulness. And he stood up, and that was the beginning of the Reformation. Are you suggesting that he said, Luther said, oh man, I'm justified because I decided to believe in God? No. Folks, it didn't happen that way. Luther's writing is clear. He realized that he had been made righteous by the sovereign God before the beginning of time that Jesus Christ in the purposes of the eternal sovereign God had purchased eternal redemption for us. And eternity is a long, long time. I strike the word time out of there. It just has no relationship to time. Folks, the law is not of faith. Seventh chapter of Romans. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. The law is a spiritual standard applied to carnal men. So it's carnal ordinances, and, and that's what we're told in Hebrews. And what the Holy Spirit makes very clear in the epistle to the Hebrews makes it crystal clear that any keeping of carnal ordinances is of no value because there is no end. We have been redeemed from the curse of the law. There remaineth therefore a rest for the sons of God. What a marvelous peace and joy there is in the heart that realizes that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? How did He do that? By being made a curse for us. Not for all. Not for all. For us. And if it's eternal redemption, it's eternal redemption. It has no end. And He was made a curse by hanging on a tree. That, that single infraction of the law was the means by which the innocent Lamb of God was made a curse for us. And He did that in order that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles in Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, the majority of Christianity today believes wholeheartedly that they must earn their way to heaven when every saint in heaven will know that they didn't deserve to be there. Try to wrap your mind around that. All right, Just let that soak in for a minute. Think about it for at least 30 seconds. Think about it. The blessing of Abraham. Oh, the blessing of Abraham. Abraham was blessed. Yeah, oh, oh we're going to inherit the... Yeah, what does that mean? Oh, we're going to inherit the kingdom. We're going to have lots of kids. We're going to father a multitude. We're going to be the, the head of a nation. No, 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 no. How was Abraham blessed? God made him righteous. He was called. He was foreknown. Foreordained. Predestinated. Justified. Glorified. Because God called him. God called him alone. Isaiah 51. The blessing of Abraham is the fact that by the grace of God and by nothing in us, nothing in ourselves, we are made righteous. You know, folks, as filthy as that old man of yours is, in God's sight, you are righteous because Jesus Christ has purchased eternal redemption for you. That's what we're studying in our text. 
doesn't seem to excite many Christians today for some reason. Now, I believe it's because we're living at the end of the age. And this, let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your word, for your grace and for the wonder of all that, that you've done for us in Christ. May the, the, that truth really grip our hearts and change our lives. May we walk rejoicing, realizing that we are in Christ Jesus, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in your sight. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. I continue to encourage you folks to trust in Him and to rest in Him. Look, we here at Blessed Hope Forever, we truly do love you all. We love you, we truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.